Oh, hello, old friend. It's good to see you. Let's talk about this word, fascination. It describes an unquenchable urge which compels our hearts to quest and be captivated. As long as there are elegant explanations to complicated phenomena, science will never lose its romance. Over the years, I've traveled the world, indulging in my fascination in physics, and now I find that a new hunger has woken within me—a fiery need to share these great ideas with the people around me. And so, I have assembled a team of some of the greatest, most lucid, most creative minds I've encountered in my travels, and I call them my titanium physicists. You are listening to the Titanium Physicist podcast, and I'm Ben Tippett. And now, Ale Physique. Hi, everyone. Everything I'm about to say comes from a podcast series I half listened to about five years ago, so pardon me for any inaccuracies. The way it happened was this. 2,000-ish years ago, the Romans conquered all of Europe, and with it, they brought government and commerce. They built roads and unified the language. People interacted with each other, and there were technical revolutions, aqueducts and stuff. People took baths. Then the Western Roman Empire collapsed. Several countries and kingdoms formed, and the languages started to diverge. Education was rare, literacy was rare, communication was difficult. It was a mud and dust time. It was a time of plagues and superstitions. It was a time for trolls and witches and elves. And then Galileo was born. He borrowed jewels from Isaac Newton and hired Christopher Columbus to discover America. And then Galileo dropped the One Ring into Mount Doom and brought about the Renaissance. Those were the Dark Ages in Europe. And did you know there was a time when the universe was in a dark age? It was an era between the time we call recombination and a time we called reionization. It was a time when nothing was emitting light. Today we're going to be talking about the dark ages of the universe. And it's funny. The dark ages end and beginning come about not from the actions of great and powerful forces. They come about from the actions of the smallest individuals. You can't get an arrow of light if all the atoms aren't shining. Who then is better to discuss these events with us than Dr. Corey Olson, the Tolkien professor? Hi, Corey. <laughs> Hello. Uh, Corey's the only person I know to have ever started his own university. The Mythgard <laughs> Institute is an online center for the study of J.R.R. Tolkien and other fantasy and science fiction literature. You can take online courses. Courses there with lectures. Anyway, it's part of the Signum University, which is in the process of being made, where you can take all sorts of courses and get actual degrees. Hooray! Hooray! Corey, for you today, I've assembled two of my proudest titanium physicists. Arise, Dr. Michael Zemkov! <laughs> Dr. Mike did his undergraduate degree at UBC with me. He did his PhD at Cardiff University in Wales. He's currently a senior postdoctoral fellow at Caltech working on experimental cosmology. Now arise, Dr. Vicky Scowcroft. <laughs> Dr. Vicky did her PhD in Liverpool, John Moore's in the UK. She's currently a postdoc at Carnegie Observatories where she works on the Carnegie Hubble program. She has a new knitting podcast called One Story Knit. And we'll have a link to it on our website if you'd like to watch a thing about knitting. Okay, everybody, let's start talking about the Dark Ages. Okay, Corey. Yes. Do you know how the universe began? Um, no, not very well. The main thing I know about it is that in the beginning was Eru the One, and then he propounded a theme of music to the Ainur, who were the offspring of his thought. And they took up the music and adorned it with themes after their own imaginings. And therefrom, the mighty music of the Ainur came. And based upon that pattern, the universe was formed. That's um, right. 
That's but, basically the, it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, that was that was I, that was pretty much where I thought we were getting to. That, of course, is Tolkien's cosmological story <laughs> uh, in the beginning of the Silmarillion. So. Yes. So at the very start, there were these weird elf god things, and they yeah. played music, and yeah. then the universe formed. Now the universe formed. As a result, it's infinitely large. People like to imagine the Big Bang as there's space, and then there's an explosion somewhere in space, and then stuff comes out of that explosion. And that's not the case. What happened is the universe started out immediately after its birth. The universe was infinitely large, and everywhere you went, it was full of stuff. And the stuff was distributed in a really uniform way. It was just gas. In essence, as well, it was really, really hot gas, so stuff was happening. Details, details. But the moral of the story is everywhere you went, the density of the gas was about the same. So you could go a million, jabillion light years in one direction, and you'd see gas in the same density as you did where it started. And you would, anywhere you went, it was pretty much the same as anywhere else you would go. Okay, gas question. How did the stuff get a million bajillion light years away so quickly? Oh, it started out a million jabillion light years away. Okay, All right. Yeah. So when we talk, talk about the Big Bang, we're not actually talking about a localized event then? No, that's right. The, the okay. Big Bang is kind of a, a misnomer. Well, I understand it started as a kind of a joke, the, the phrase Big mm-hmm. Bang. W- wasn't that name uh, given derisively to the theory when it was first? Yes. F- I, that was my understanding. Yes. And yeah. then we were like, oh, actually, this is right. Okay. So the Big Bang is not as often understood, you know, ball of matter, which then exploded. So at the beginning, the infinitely sized universe was because c- infinite is a big number. Yes. It's just, it's a very big but, number. Yeah, yeah. That's, so the that's thing always is, been my... the universe isn't expanding into anything. It's just expanding itself. So it's always kind of infinite. But that if it's sense. infinite, in what sense can it be said to be expanding? Yeah, the distance between any two points in it is increasing. Let's say you're, you're, you travel back in time, uh, you're Zeus or something, yeah. <clears throat> and you take two planets and you put them you know, uh, 30 light years apart in the very early universe. Put okay. planet A over here, planet B over here. In time, they, the distance between them, they won't feel like they're moving apart from each other. They're just sitting still. But the distance between them will be increasing over time. So it's, it's like it's the very concept of distance itself that, that's expanding. It's space-time itself that's expanding, not, not everything moving uh, in, in any way. So if we say that things aren't expanding, but that space-time is expanding, um, what is the thing that's expanding. That is, if we say, you know, on the one hand over here, we've got all the things, yeah. and over here, on the other hand, we've got, you know, the space-time continuum. What is that over there? I mean, if... So I'm just trying to understand, <clears throat> then, what exactly it is that is expanding if it's not stuff that's expanding. There's an ambiguity here in our language when it comes down to it. Right, um, right. So when we talk about something that's moving away from you, let's say you're standing on the street and somebody you know, on a bicycle is moving away from you. Right. You're describing motion. It's true. You're saying, if I was on that bike, I would feel wind against my face, you know, whereas I'm standing right. still, I'm not feeling any wind, things like that. But right. And this is how our language is built. But when you start doing the physics of it, when you describe this type of motion, you're not talking about wind on your face or anything like that. You're saying the distance between you and the bicycle is increasing, right? right? All the way up through Newton until Albert Einstein came along. And Albert yeah. Einstein said, what's up with gravity? Which was mm-hmm. an interesting question. Isaac Newton had a theory of universal gravitation. It works really well when you're describing the motion of the planets around the sun, things like that. Fantastic. Basically, as long as things don't start moving close to the speed of light, we're fine with Newton. Or as long as the gravitational fields aren't too intense. <laughs> kind of. Yeah, so Mercury doesn't quite obey Newton's laws okay. as much as it should. There's a tiny precession in Mercury's orbit that can't be explained using Newton's laws. Okay. But for the most part, Newton works really, really well. And what Newton right. assumed was that the concept of distance wouldn't change. Right. But Einstein said, well, there's, there's some mysteries here. He invented special relativity that said that time dilates and length contracts and stuff like that. Right. And from that came the abstraction of space-time. And so somebody said, hey, what if we can talk about things moving around on the surface called space-time? But I said, oh, that's a nice abstraction of the work I've done. What if this space-time surface was curved itself? Right. What if there was some curvature? What if there were some dynamics to it? And so in Einstein's picture, the Earth doesn't orbit around the sun because the sun is pulling on the Earth using an invisible cord. Uh, right. The Earth is going around the sun because space-time, the surface describing distances and times between events, itself is curved. So the space-time is like a curved surface. The Earth is always moving in a straight line. But because it's a straight line on a curved surface, it closes in on itself, and you see the Earth going around in a 
loop. Right. And that's general relativity, essentially. Yeah, yeah. So Einstein introduced this idea that space-time, this idea of distance itself, was a dynamic quantity. Mm -hmm. Okay? And so what happened was you can apply Einstein's theory to talk about this universal setup where everything starts out pretty uniform, undifferentiated matter. Mm -hmm. There's no difference between one point and another. And when you apply these equations to it, the distance between two points that aren't moving... Feel no motion. None of them have rockets. None of them are on bicycles. But the mm-hmm. distance between them can be dynamic, even if they're not properly moving. And so this is what's expanding in the, in the universe. It's like, a, it's like if you take two ants and you put them on a squished up sponge, and then you let the sponge go so the sponge expands, the ants will say, oh, we're moving apart from one another. But really what's happening is the sponge underneath them is expanding. Right. So they don't feel that they are moving relative to the things immediately surrounding them. Yeah, that's right. And yet the distance is expanding. They're like, I'm stuck to this point on the sponge. And the other ant's like, I'm stuck to this point on the sponge. But they see the distance between each other increasing. So this is essentially a mathematical construction designed to explain or show the patterns of these kinds of motion. Because it sounds like the thing that is explained in a different way is how these things can be moving differently apart without any impetus of motion for any one of them. As you say, they don't any one of them have a bicycle, and yet they're moving apart. Why are they moving apart? The way you stated it, it's, it's kind of backwards to how it happened in history. What okay. happened was uh, the people applied the mathematics to these very simple models. The, the assumption that the universe is initially full of undifferentiated matter, where it's not denser in one point than another, it simplifies the mathematics quite a great deal, right? So when Einstein first proposed his theory, they applied the symmetry to it to make the equations be much easier to solve. And right. they saw these dynamical universes. So these, these mathematical models describing universes that expanded and collapsed. And Einstein saw them and was like, that's BS. No way is that possible. And so he introduced this term, the, the cosmological constant. He's famous for saying it was his greatest blunder. He introduced this special term into the equations that would keep everything still. And then he said, there. The universe is obviously sitting still. We don't need to deal with it. And then immediately after, the astronomer Hubble discovered right. that the universe itself is actually expanding. And so these, these models describing the universe expanding that we were talking about actually fit the data to a remarkable degree. The data being the modern astronomical data. That's right. So what we have here is a picture where the universe starts off kind of undifferentiated. Everything's really, really hot. If you take a gas and you put it in a cylinder and then you compress the cylinder... The air inside of it heats up. And the reason for that is the temperature is kind of a description of the energy density, how right. much energy is there per volume. And so if you squish the volume smaller and smaller and smaller, the energy density goes up, even though the particles themselves don't feel like they're moving any faster. They're bumping into each other a lot more. And so the temperature itself goes up. And if you increase a gas's temperature hotter and hotter and hotter, what happens is they start bumping into each other enough that they start knocking off electrons. And so in the very early universe, there was a time when there was just a soup of hydrogen, a little bit of helium. It was so dense, so hot back then, because the universe was smaller than it is today, so everything was much denser, that the hydrogen was all ionized. It was all a plasma. Yeah, have you got a question? I do. What happened to infinite? It's, it was still infinite. It's just... Hey, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, yeah, wait. yeah, okay. How can one thing be infinite and smaller than another thing that's infinite? Uh, so you're, you're absolutely right. The complaint, that's an old Greek philosopher complaint, and I appreciate yes. it. So what we're saying here is, I mean, we do, we describe it as increasing in size the way the ants on the sponge would. They say, oh, the right. volume in you know, the sponge is increasing, right? Right, um, right? But what we actually describe in terms of things increasing and decreasing is we talk about the density of matter mm-hmm. increasing and decreasing. Because okay. the density... As the ants on the sponge, as you squish up the sponge, as they get closer together, more ants are going to fit inside of a box that you draw around the line. Right. Okay? Right. And, yeah. and, and so the density of ants on the sponge on, in your, inside your little box is increasing or decreasing. Even if you can't talk about the volume of the universe increasing and decreasing. The density increases and decreases. Okay. So essentially it sounds, if I'm understanding then, uh-huh. um, it sounds like the question which would say – is the universe actually infinite or finite in size is a question in which you're not particularly interested because as you were saying, if it, if it were infinite, we wouldn't be able to know it. Is that right? So basically you treat it mathematically as if it's infinite, but in fact we just sort of confess ignorance on that question? Yes, very good. Okay. You can come up with very strange column topologies to the universe, right, where – It looks infinite, but it's not. Like picture a donut where you can go around it in different ways, 
and you end up on different spots, but it is a finite thing. So it's a hard question and people try to figure out ways to determine the answer to it. But I would say that it's considered part of esoteria. Okay. So basically, you you feel fairly confident that the universe is at the very least larger than we can possibly measure, and so therefore it might as well be infinite. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And that mathematically it's described by a model which says it's infinite. Okay. I'm willing to let it go, but that's a little bit of a stumbling block to me because, again, mathematic infinity, like what what infinity does to equations, uh, it, it seems to me... Not necessarily to describe, because again, to say it's bigger than we can measure is mathematically, not to mention philosophically, a very different thing from saying it's infinite. It yeah. kind of seems to me that to actually use mathematical infinity in your equations to describe the universe seems to me like it, it at least potentially introduces some hand-waving into things and inaccuracy. Because, again, if it's, if it's not actually infinite, but just really, really big, yeah. even bigger than we can measure, then the equations, in fact, might come out very, very differently if you have a finite versus an infinite number. Because that's a very significant difference. Yeah, well, I mean, physics is a really local thing. Mm -hmm. You need to do some pretty bonkers thing to have what happens at infinity enter your equations because information will only propagate at the speed of light. If we assume that a very, very large patch around us, larger than we could ever measure, has the same consistent density, then we would say it might not be infinite, but mathematically we can't tell the difference between this and infinity. And it's not like infinity enters in the equations, really. All, okay. we, all it does is the equations become very simple, and there's no edge to anything. Okay. So it's not quite as spooky as we make it sound when we okay. say infinite. We just mean that it's the same everywhere you go, and there's no edge. Right. And, and to be fair, the, uh, everything we're going to talk about today is completely agnostic to that kind of question. <laughs> yeah, okay. True. Fair enough. So, so we're expanding. We got the ants on a sponge, and this is a description of the way that the stuff in the universe actually moves apart from the rest of the stuff. Yeah. Essentially, the early universe is a gas uh-huh. and a really, really hot gas. And so essentially what it's made up of protons and electrons. Protons have positive charge. Electrons have negative charge. And photons, light. Right. And, you know, light interacts really strongly with protons and electrons. And so everything's bouncing around like crazy. Photon comes in, smashes an electron, sends it flying in a different direction. Proton and electron might try to join together to make a neutral atom. And in doing so, they'll shoot off a photon. But then before too long, another photon comes in and breaks them up. Okay? Okay. So everything's right. dynamic and crazy and really, really fuzzy. Yes. And this was bright. It emitted a lot of light. It was like the color of a hot gas. And this, this is understood to be more or less universal. So we're talking about an enormously bright sponge. That's right. Well, everywhere you go, it was the same gaseous amount of bright. Sponge. That's right. Yes. Gaseous sponge. Um, right. Like I keep saying, the universe underfoot was expanding. And so the distance between all these atoms on the sponge are getting bigger. And that cools down. The gas... And the photons are going to, it's called red shifting. The expansion of the universe makes the photons redder in color. The energy decreases as time goes on. And so what happens is, as the universe as it expands, the photons cool. The photons, on average, won't be energetic enough to knock the electron and the proton apart. Okay. And there would be presumably fewer of those collisions as they separate. Yeah, that's right. Case. Right. right. So, yes. And so you have all these photons suddenly around that aren't blue colored enough to knock apart the protons and electrons. And so they're not really interacting with anything. We call this era recombination. Recombination. Is there a net decrease in the number of photons? Or is it just that they interact less frequently with other particles? Well, these photons, they're kind of, uh, they're kind of like lost dogs left behind after the, after the party. They, okay. uh, so sad. They, they don't, yeah. <laughs> they, they make up something called the cosmic microwave background. Uh, because they, they stop kind of interacting that strongly with matter, but they're still kicking around. And the universe is full of them. As the universe expanded, they got cooler and cooler, more red, red color, until now they're microwaves. And essentially the universe is just kind of full of this microwave background bath of radiation. And the uniformity of this mm-hmm. is the reason why you are suggesting no localized center of a Big Bang at the beginning, because that's not the pattern we would expect to see if things had started from one point and were radiating outward. That's right. So the uniform background radiation is what suggests that that's not, in fact, how it happened. Right. So uh, this recombination happened 400,000 years after 
T equals zero. So we had the really hot glowing sponge for 400,000 years? Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. Recombination in question. The things that are combining are protons and electrons? That's right. Into hydrogen atoms, rather. Into hydrogen atoms, Primarily. yeah. Uh, it's called recombination because they used to be combined. Uh, I, apparently, that's a misnomer. Uh, ah, they just uh, there's a, there's another type of radiation in the universe called recombination. Only it happens around stars and stuff. Awesome. And that's so, the kind of thing that drives physics students absolutely. Oh, crazy. isn't it horrible? Can I say <laughs> that that piece of nomenclature is no friend to public explanation? So, no okay. friend. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, so it's called recombination, though they'd never combined before, mm -hmm. and. To so T equals 400,000 years. What is the threshold that we have crossed that makes us say, and now begins the recombination period? Like, is it when the photons drop down to a particular energy level? Yeah. When, they, when the photons, on average, can't ionize the gas anymore. We consider that epoch to be the time when the CMB was released, because we're saying the same thing. The technical definition is the time at which photons and matter are decoupled from one another. Okay. So those are all saying the same thing. So whereas before they were just in this sort of chaotic mix and hydrogen atoms forming and being uh, unformed and photons flying all over the place and dying and being born. And, and so now we've reached a more stable state of hydrogen atoms, which now by and large uh, with fewer exceptions, are able and content to remain hydrogen atoms, and the photons have now calmed down and are no longer disrupting so many atoms, and therefore we have a stable population of hydrogen atoms and a more calm uh, level of photons floating around, and nobody's colliding with each other nearly so much as they used to be. The party's over. <laughs> Everybody's right. gone home with their partner. Yes, exactly. It really does sound uh, – th yes, that was actually something very much like what I had in my head right there. Yeah. To go back to Ben's analogy, this is the time when the Goths are sacking Rome. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> then what happens is essentially the universe is – it's still very uniform. Everywhere you go, the density of matter is still about the same. But it's not emitting light anymore. And the universe is full of neutral hydrogen gas. Right, so you've got all, all this neutral hydrogen that's like everywhere. Right. But then as the universe, could, the universe is continuing to expand and cool, this hydrogen doesn't have as, as much energy anymore. And eventually gravity will pull these atoms together. And the same with dark matter. So dark matter is just there hanging around, but it doesn't interact with the photons anyway. So the dark matter is starting to form clumps. The hydrogen starts to fall in there too. Now you're starting to get structure. Uh -huh. Can I ask two questions? Okay. Question number one. What is it that makes the hydrogen atoms join together? Doesn't that require energy? So you've got your dark matter that doesn't interact with light. And the right. dark matter basically only interacts with itself. So the gravitational interaction of, of the dark matter particles will start to clump them together. Okay. And then your hydrogen atoms can also interact through gravity with dark matter. And then they join in the clumps. Does that make sense? I think I have to ask first my second question, which is, what is dark matter made of? We don't know. <laughs> we don't know by definition because it's by dark definition, and therefore yeah, doesn't we, interact with light. It only interacts by gravity. That's all we know about it. So we know about it basically by calculating total mass and subtracting the mass of the stuff we can see and saying, yeah. gosh, there's mass left over. That is all I know about dark matter. Yeah, that's it. So... That's, so, like, okay, they measured galaxies, and then they were like, that's not right. Right. So. There's something that's monkeying with the numbers there. Um, yeah. Now, what then leads us to believe that it forms it clumps in some sense? We see its okay. effect in galaxies. I mean, it, like, it tends to form these halos around galaxies. Okay. So you've got these huge dark matter halos. And that's how we kind of see it interacting. So we know that it interacts via gravity and that it will clump okay, so together. We, we can see its gravitational effects on other yeah. things. Yes. Okay. So by watching the patterns of movement of the things we can see, we can say, gosh, this looks like it has some kind of an orbital interaction with mm -hmm. something else that we can't see. Or rather, its orbital pattern would be explained by a massive object or some sort of mass in which we can't see. So then, therefore, dark matter does interact gravitationally with yes. stuff. It is only dark in as much as it doesn't interact with light, yes. with photons. 
Okay. So this started happening around 500 million years after T equals zero. Yeah. So this is like oh a goodness. long time later. Right, so we've, we've so we've totally left the the bright sponge in the dust. I mean, it's like yeah, ancient the bright history. Bright sponge at this point. is gone. It's just absolutely. Like, so the bright sponge lasted for 400,000 years, and then it's been now 499 million and 600,000 years since then. Yes. I'm right. glad you can do maths in your head. I can't do it. <laughs> okay. I'm just, yes. just trying to make sure I'm understanding the scale properly. Okay. Yeah. So, like, that's... this is like a super long time later. It's yeah, just absolutely. like now we're starting to form structure and, and we're getting the first stars. So, these first stars are like proper weird because they're only made of hydrogen. So, like, the stars you see today have hydrogen and helium and like all these other elements, but these first mm-hmm. ones are just hydrogen. So, they're really massive. They're literally huge giant balls of hydrogen. They're, they're like, a hundred times more massive than the sun and they're really really hot so they emit like tons of uv light and they're just insane these weird stars so i'm trying to make sure that i understand why this is happening um we are getting cooler and more spread apart Mm -hmm. and so of course one would think that in theory things would clump together less not more as time goes on basically the reason they're clumping together now where they didn't before is that before you had those super energetic protons agitating everything and so nothing could settle so even when things were colliding nothing was coming of it and so when finally like you know we've put the kids to bed and we have peace and quiet uh now like they although they interact less frequently the hydrogen atoms um Mm -hmm. because they're further apart they do still occasionally by chance hit each other and when they they do they now can gravitationally form up together yes. um, so and that's why also it would take so much more time because they're yeah. spread apart and getting yeah, further apart. they're even further apart but then when they do clump together there's not going to be a photon that comes on and kicks them apart again it's right exactly they just so now you've got you've got these gravitational structures and then they can collapse further and make make the first stars and like the dark matter we, we don't have any idea how or the dark matter is interacting with the actual star formation the, the dark matter is important because it's providing the seed for the other baryons we call them the stuff that makes light basically that, that interacts electromagnetically um, okay they're providing a seed for that because just to go back a couple steps, a, a definitional difference between dark matter and baryons is that dark matter is defined by the fact that it only interacts gravitationally. And then baryons is kind of like everything else. Okay. Right? Right. So what's happening is dark matter sees a bunch of dark matter and where there's over dense regions and under dense regions, it starts to fall down and get denser and denser. And then in other parts of the universe, you know, more and more under dense. And baryons are more complicated, right? Because they can talk to each other through all these different mechanisms. And so they have a kind of property where they both want to attract and they want to repulse each other. And it gets complicated. Right. We the dark matter gravity is going on as well as the ele- – Exactly. Gravity, electromagnetic, electromagnetic forces. Those are the yeah. dominant yeah. things. So basically the dark matter is giving a place that the baryons can live preferentially closer together. That's right. its function. Okay. The way that it provides this place is gravitationally, right? So it by being gravitational – stuff it helps gravitationally to attract hydrogen atoms together and then those hydrogen atoms interact with each other in these ways so even though none of them are actually interacting with the dark matter in any way other than gravitational it's like so the dark matter is basically sending out the invitations Uh, see the metaphor of seed uh was troubling to me for a second because that suggests that the dark matter is in some way going to turn into the other stuff or or something so it's like imagine you have a gymnasium Full of people, okay. right? And there's two right. types of people. There's posers and there's cool dudes, okay? okay? Cool dudes. So the yeah. cool dudes don't care what the regular people are doing. They don't talk to each other. They don't talk to the regular people. Right. They're far too cool to even interact with each other. That's right. Well, no, they, they don't interact with anybody else. But they have their own uh, – they, they're cool. Everybody wants you. So, so the deal is they kind of clump up at first. They're like, hey, man, that's the cool place to stand in the gymnasium. Right. Right. And then all the rest of the people who interact with each other, they're calling each other back and forth and they're moving around a lot. They go, oh, maybe there's something going on in the, the cool places at those little clumps. <laughs> and so they start to gravitate. And the more people go to those places, 
the more other people the more around them are like, oh, hey, look, that's the place to be. And so you end up with everything collapsing down around these centers that were started right. by the cool people. So the cool people who are cool but entirely misanthropic and don't, yeah. in fact, interact with anybody. They're cool. Um, but still have this magnetic sense of coolness which draws other people to them. And then the other people, when they're there, they're like, hey, you like this cool person. I like this cool person. Let's get together. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So that's like – Forming your first like proto galaxy star. Okay, proto galaxy. Right. So we've got the star, and I've always been a little shaky on star formation. Uh, but if enough of this matter gets together in the one place and forms a gravitational center, then these things are gonna, you know, a, a, a large enough gravitational clump. Then this stuff is gonna start interacting in this way, we've being got emitted. This, this clump of stuff, and then yeah. once it gets enough mass in a concentrated space, then it will it will collapse gravitationally. Like the gravitational right. energy will collapse it, and then it's become so dense the the hydrogen can interact and fuse, and then that's what's going to release your energy. Right. So then that's when you're now talking about star formation, and or, yeah. and you were talking supermassive stars. Yeah, these these are huge stars. They're they're only right. hydrogen. It, there's no other elements in the universe at this point. So these these are just hydrogen. They're they're massive. They're really really hot. And they live for a really, really short time. And this is happening at like a billion years after T equals zero. We were at 400,000 at the end of the bright sponge phase and yeah. uh, with the beginning of the combination phase, which we call the recombination phase for some reason. And yeah. then that was at 400,000. And that lasted until 600 million. So the dark ages Five. goes to like 500 million years. 500 million. And then that's when the gravitational effects start to happen. And then you're starting okay. to form structure. So, and then so, like so a billion we, we, years, we, your stars start to appeal, appear. Okay. All right. So from 500 million to 1 billion, the gravitational clustering and the stars are finished forming at about a billion. Well, they're not finished forming. They're still no, forming. Of course. Today. Yeah, they're still but in this, process. This first population of stars, this is when they're forming. Okay. Just to go back another step, the, the gravitational collapse is happening the whole time. It's kind of like it takes that whole 500 million years to go from this kind of pretty uniform soup of neutral stuff to the point where you actually have these nucleated things that can start, you know, lighting their furnaces, so to speak. Right. So, right, right. so that, that evolution is happening the whole time. And OK, so we have a definition. And I hate to do this to you because recombination was the first one that's bad. We have another yeah. crappy astronomy definition here, which is awesome. astrophysicists call metals to mean anything that isn't helium and hydrogen. Anything heavier than that is a metal. Right. So yeah. I introduce that because if I don't, I'm going to say metals and you're going to think right. of, you know, like steel land. and I don't mean right. that. Yeah, exactly. Right. Okay. Uh, oxygen is a metal. Got right. it. Okay. So when you have these stars that are just helium and hydrogen, helium doesn't participate. Hydrogen is the thing that matters. The point is that in the local universe, when we look around us and we ask how do stars form, you have to get this huge mass of gas into a fairly compact region. You know, what's the density yes. of the sun? It's like the density of water, right? Something like that. So you need to get pretty dense in order yes. for the hydrogens to want to fuse. So right. in the local universe, Can you define are, local, please, based on how you're using it here? Local means our galaxy and galaxy we, we see around us in this context. Okay. okay. So, you know, when guys go out and they look at, you know, beautiful star-forming regions like you see with Hubble and stuff, I'm, I'm thinking of that process. Okay. So... In that process, there's a thermodynamic problem, which is that as you pack stuff together, you know, with gravity, it gets hotter. And when things get hotter, they want to expand back out again. So you need some way to shed that heat in star formation. And so in the local universe, I guess by local here, I'm expanding my definition to mean anytime there are metals. Because in right. sort of normal star formation, what happens is the metals have a bunch of, you know, complicated quantum level transitions that they can do with electrons and other atoms and things like that, chemistry, sure. basically. They can eject energy that way. They can emit photons at all different wavelengths, and, and basically it comes out in the infrared and submillimeter. But basically they can shed that heat very efficiently, which leads them to be able to make small stars like our sun, or even smaller. Now, when you take the metals away and you're stuck with just hydrogen, there's only really one cooling mechanism, and it's very inefficient. So the property of that is that it takes a lot of mass to get everything kind of close enough together to start fusing in the center and turning it into an actual star. Right. So these early stars, we call them population three. It's the first generation of stars in the universe. Um, and they're <laughs> cool to understand. 
<laughs> and it's called Population 3? Population 1 is now, and then Population 2 is the ones before now, and we thought that was it. And then we're like, oh no, there's Population 3 as well. I see, so we're right. counting backwards in time in the populations. From now, okay. yeah. I see. Can I also just say that like, sure. I find the metals thing is way more excusable than the recombination. <laughs> I know, thing. that was bananas. <laughs> like, that doesn't make a lick of sense at all. But the metals thing, one could say that perhaps the choice of the word metal was a little unfortunate. But I can certainly see from a chemical and sort of quantum physics standpoint why you would want a category which was all elements that are not hydrogen and helium. I mean, the difference between hydrogen and helium on the one hand and all the other elements on the other hand, that distinction from like an astrophysics standpoint makes perfect sense that you would want to have those two categories. But to call that second category metals, that's the really dumb thing. It's a little bit more wieldy than the uh, elemental products of nucleosynthesis, right? Right. Though even an acronym is better than uh, the name of another category yeah. that we already exist and call something else. <laughs> Maybe it was designed actually to foment discord between astrophysicists and chemists. Astrophysicists <laughs> love to make up completely nonsensical names for things. So yes. this yes. won't be the last time you think that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So anyway, so we were saying uh, we had gotten so far as uh, the formation of these supermassive hydrogen only stars which are now beginning to fuse and to emit light. Okay. Yes. Now we're starting to get light again. And it's about a billion so, years. Yeah. So now we've got these stars that, that, by the way, we've never actually seen. Nobody's ever seen one, but we know right. that. So they're starting to emit light again. And we also have quasars. So quasars are like super bright galaxies with black holes in the center, which are also ionizing. So now you've got these two sources the first galaxies and the first stars that are starting to emit light. And now these are emitting light that is much more energetic than, than what was left over before right. in the microwave background. You've got like this big clump of gas and then that starts to like fragment and make your first group of stars. Right. And so they're at, kind of already in a cluster, if you get okay. me. Okay. And then as time evolves, then those first stars are, are going to go supernova. They're going to explode. And that's going to happen pretty quickly because they're so big. They don't live for very long. And that's going to send out a lot of radiation. It's, now he's going to start to get metals. I was going to say, now we're going to get metals all over the place. Yeah. We get the stars going so, supernova. So now your new lot of stars can form, which is what we call population two, which are the oldest stars we see today. And they do okay. have a bit of metal in them. But now you're going to start to see things that look more like galaxies do today. The population two stars begin to form then, and I assume the the population two stars that are still around are, yes. are must be small, right, if they're still around, presumably, right? Those, yeah, they're we once... still see them today. We still see them in things like globular clusters. We, right. we do still see the population two stars. But it's this process of, like, the fir- very first stars forming from this hydrogen that, that starts to begin to reionize the universe. Right, because we still have our old tired photons out yes. there forming the microwave background and mining it their own business now. Um, yeah. But now, because of the fusion that's going on in the cores of our supermassive weird hydrogen stars, we now have new, much more energetic and thus interfering photons, which are going out and energizing stuff. Yeah. And, then, and thus we have the end of what what you're calling the dark age because now we have light again with the the yeah the, that's that's the very start of it is when these stars start to form I think right so we're at the stage we're giving way to some nice baroque music in the background and and we're starting to form little galaxies and things like that <laughs> um, so the big question is we have this fairly uniform soup of neutral hydrogen and helium in the early universe. And then we have the universe we see it today. And one property of uh, the hydrogen is it absorbs photons, right? So light can't go very far through it. So on the other hand, the universe we have today, we can essentially see billions of years into the past, which means that at some point, the universe has gone from this neutral absorby thing to a transparent non-absorby thing. And what is that process? So the, the answer to that process is it's reionization, and it's because of the kind of objects we were just talking about with Vicky. And one property of these objects is that when you have a supermassive star, it puts out a lot of ultraviolet photons, which are exactly the kind of photons that cut like a knife through this neutral stuff and start to basically bump electrons off the protons and make the universe transparent. So if you picture it, 
you have a little proto galaxy in the center of this dark matter potential in this uniform soup of uh, of neutral hydrogen, okay. and you're going to just burn that away. So you have this little light bulb in the middle. I, I, I told Ben earlier, it's like if you had a candle, a, a thing of wax, and you took a Christmas light and you put it in the wax, it right. just starts melting slowly, slowly, slowly through that medium, turning it so it's transparent. <clears throat> okay, so it, it, deionization, that's what you No, reionization it. because... Reionization, what, reionization. Because if okay. you remember, we've gone from an ionized universe back... Right, so we're turning when. the hydrogen atoms back into ions again. Yeah, this, exactly. this, this re... The, this, the this prefix is re, re is meaningful this time. <laughs> right, right, okay, exactly, <laughs> right, right, okay. The process basically looks like a bunch of bubbles, like Swiss cheese... And yep. the bubbles get bigger and bigger and start, bubbles forming and start around meeting the stars up and, and eventually – right? Exactly. And that's, okay. that's how we get the universe we see today. So that's interesting and it's interesting because it's the one part of cosmic evolution that we don't know very much about and we would like to understand more, most of cosmic evolution. But specifically this transition from the dark ages to – sort of the transparent universe is a very hot topic in astrophysics these days. And it's because of all the weird processes that are involved that, that there are no local analogs to. Can I try a Lord of the Rings metaphor now? Hey, do let's it. do that. Okay, so it's like, okay, so you got this battlefield, right? Yeah. And it's covered in orcs. Okay. Orcs. They're shooting arrows and stuff. It's but the, several times. The yeah. deal is that an arrow can't travel very far in a battlefield without hitting an orc. Right. Um, <clears throat> Which is an advantage if you're opposing the orcs. That's right. But, you know, uh, let's say you want to send a message to somebody by tying a note to an arrow and shooting it over at your friend, your bone. A mechanism which can easily be misconstrued during a battle, I have to point out. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> but anyway, yes, carry on. I was thinking about on. doing this in terms of throwing hobbits at each other, but let's we'll, right. we'll stick with orcs for now. <laughs> that, that also can be misconstrued. <laughs> One, one, Nobody one tosses a dwarf. To yeah, right. right, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, oh, dwarves, that'd be good. Anyway, <clears throat> let's go, keep going with arrows, though, right? So okay. essentially, you've got these clumps of elves surrounded, surrounded by uh, orcs. And what yes. they do is they just shoot a whole bunch of arrows out. They're just shooting arrows out and arrows out, pushing the orcs back. Turning them into stuff that doesn't absorb arrows, specifically dead bodies lying on the Corpses ground. Corpses lying on the ground. Right. Exactly. Yeah. right yeah. Until, right. until these clumps of elves have pushed back all of the orcs so that all of them are either pushed back into clumps or blown away and not absorbing arrows anymore. And you can send your nice arrow message over to Legolas and say, hey, what kind of conditioner do you use? Right. Um, <laughs> that, is a, that is indeed a grim picture of, uh, <laughs> of this process. <laughs> Uh, if we're reionizing things, why don't we get like the return of the bright sponge? Because the atoms that are being ionized are further apart from each other than they, than they were before. So it's this it's this thing that can absorb photons, just like orcs can absorb arrows. Once the arrow is gone, it's out of play. Right. But back in the good old days, you know, before we started recombining, photons would come in and they would hit hydrogen atom and they would ionize it and they would fly off. So basically it's just they're not bumping. So the, the, the photons it's, it's, are absorbed by the hydrogen. So the, that process of the ionization of hydrogen doesn't release energy. It's an energy balance thing. It's that it's in the early balance. universe, you had a whole bunch of energy. And then at recombination, you've released a lot of that energy in the form of photons that are no longer coupled to the matter. Right. And then the universe expands. And so those original photons that got released out of that process are out of play now. There's the background infrared photons that are now old and cranky. Exactly. And, and exactly. Okay. And now you're using different photons from a sort of a different bank right. to do the reionization. And so they're enough to reionize the universe, but not enough to fill it with a uniform bath of photons like there used okay. to be. So the, just thinking individually, um, thinking of you know one photon hitting one hydrogen atom and the hydrogen atom is ionized, this does not re release energy? It liberates the electron from the proton, but it doesn't right. actually cost energy. So, so no photon would be emitted uh, from that process? Correct. It's absorbed. Okay. And then the electrons out in space... The, the universe right. has gotten bigger since then. They're much less likely to run into another proton and reform a That's, hydrogen atom. Yeah, it's going to die yeah. alone. Or maybe yeah. get bound up in a galaxy later on and be happy. Who knows? Right. Okay, yeah. so we don't understand that process. So there's several questions that would help us understand. So one is exactly in detail, how do these population three stars work? We don't know. We've never okay. seen one. 
we can right. kind of guess, but eh, you know. One is, and this is a hot topic right now, what were the galaxies or proto-galaxies responsible for this reionization process? What did they look like? How do they compare with stuff we see around us today? They're probably very low mass, and low mass means faint, so hard to see, so we're going to have a hard time studying them. But that's a big question right now is how did the metals, for example, get put into the other stars to make population two stars? What was that process? Right. So these are things we're just starting to maybe understand a little bit about observationally, but definitely there's a lot more work to do. Right. Um, how do we know anything about this, right? So you can make measurements three different ways. Basically, you can look at the light that would have been, if the universe was neutral and the photons were getting absorbed, you can look at the wavelengths where that process would be happening and say, okay, I see it now or I don't see it now. So mm -hmm. we're having a lot of success there. We're seeing kind of midway back into this process where we're looking at very distant, very faint galaxies and saying, ah, I see that guy and it's at whatever distance. And so at least I can see that far back and you can study basically the area around it and ask questions about what are the metals there? What's the gas doing? All these kind of things. Right. There's a second way, which is kind of complicated and we can spend time on it if you want, which is that the cosmic microwave background, I've been, we've been kind of fibbing to you a little bit, right? Okay. You said it's not coupled. I knew it. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> it is a little bit coupled. So you actually get a, a couple different effects where that uniform soup of photons that, that's old and tired now is still a little bit talking to the matter. Now that it's got ionized again, it can talk to the electrons. And so we can look at you know microwave frequencies today and look for various distortions the recombination cosmic microwave background is very simple. The physics is understood. You can write down equations and do some math and say, ah, it looks like this. But the lower redshift stuff is not simple and it's nonlinear and it's kind of ugly. So what you basically do is you're going into the cosmic microwave background and you're saying, where's all the ugly bits that I can't explain with a simple picture? Right. And so from that, we know that reionization happened. We're kind of certain it was sort of happening at this sort of 500 million years ago mark. You know, and then what had a span of, you know, a few hundred million years. But uh, that's a picture that's just now emerging. And then finally, you can study the neutral hydrogen. So what happens is the hydrogen in the early universe is kind of banging around, but you can actually form molecular hydrogen, which is two hydrogen atoms that are, you know, molecularly bonded by sharing electrons. So you maybe remember this from earlier studies, but the Hydrogens actually have a quantum way to talk to each other called a hyperfine splitting that emits photons at very long wavelengths. It's very low energy. So we can actually take radio telescopes and look for that very low energy, very rare form of emission. And you can see that in the local universe, right? In our own galaxy, it's very bright at this wavelength. But that emission, of course, is happening in the distant universe. It's just it's very far away and very faint. So... The new thing that people are talking about doing is you build a telescope that works at this 21 centimeter, but now redshifted to about a centimeter because of the distance from you to where it's coming from. And you can actually use that to make basically X-ray scans or actually an X-ray is the wrong analogy, actually MRIs. By tuning the frequency, you can basically take slices of what's the neutral hydrogen doing at those high redshifts. And you can sort of take pictures of the Swiss cheese of the universe at that time. And it's going to tell you a lot about the structure, how the structure is formed. Huh. So there's a lot of excitement in astrophysics these days. It's a big new direction that people are building a bunch of instruments for. And it's very difficult. So the new instruments, you know, may or may not see something, who knows. But you'll hear over the next decade, they're building this telescope called the Square Kilometer Array. It's one kilometer of collecting area. Okay, Please. can I just say that the nomenclature... This is the thing that really gets to me about astronomy, is that when astronomers and astrophysicists go to name objects or forces or parameters for bodies or anything like that, they're over-inventive sometimes with names, and then they go to name telescope arrays and completely make fools of themselves. Can I just say that, like... Did you see, like, maybe a week ago, there was an XKCD comic about the name yes, of Yes, I did. I did, yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm a big fan of XKCD. And, <laughs> and is dead on about yeah. the, the name of the telescope arrays, which are just as dumb as they could possibly be. Uh, so can I just say the square kilometer array is not helping. Um, really not. 
I'm sorry. There's actually a website you can go look up called Dumb Astronomy Acronyms, or Duh. <laughs> and it, you go in and it, it, it'll describe, and there's some spectacularly bad ones in there. Yes. Anyway. I can easily imagine this. But anyway, okay, so the Square Kilometer Array. I apologize uh, is, for the Square Kilometer Array. That's On behalf okay. Of that, the behind the scenes is all these things get a working title until they're built, and then they get named after some rich benefactor. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and that's, so. you know, understandable. Hey, but you know, like, I'm still pleased anyway that the astronomical community as a whole decided to stick with the mythology theme, you know, when they started naming new planets and stuff. I thought that was cool. I was glad that they, because, you know, I mean, the astronomers who are, who are naming the new planets were, you know, in a very different place culturally from the astronomers who named the, the other planets. Do you mean like Sedna? Yeah. Yeah. Like the little sort of semi planets. The or dwarf whatever. planets. The planets that the dwarves oh, yeah. live on. <laughs> yeah, see, this is why I object to the phrase dwarf planet. So so actually in astrophysics, there's a big – everybody's a Tolkien fan, right? So there's a very big trend in uh, naming instruments after, you know, all and sundry. So there is an instrument called Sauron. Yep. <laughs> I think there is an instrument called Melko, things like that, right? Really? Yeah. yeah. That's pretty cool. Though I have to say, they named an instrument after Melkor? I think you'd have to look it up. But they're yeah. naming instruments after various And things. it's really hard because they'll, they'll think of the cool acronym, like Sauron, and they're like, how do we make that? Right, and then they have to to the absolutely <laughs> over backwards to make it fit yeah. the acronym, yeah. And that's okay. You know, that I think is fine. <laughs> um, I actually fully applaud that. Which is better, to think of the acronym first and then put in some stupid words that no one's going to remember or ever say anyway to fit it, <laughs> or to think of some kind of sensible phrase that describes it for which the acronym is really stupid and hard to remember. So, you know, clearly that's, that's obviously the way to go. But I, I'm just saying that I don't think I would name an instrument after Melkor. I just wouldn't. I don't think it's a good idea. Um, I think you're begging for problems. Um, but, uh, yeah. He's supposed to be yeah. out there somewhere, right? Maybe he'll come back. Well, yeah, see that... I would count, I would this is one of the problems uh you know one of the undesirable events one in fact would not want to hurry along um according to Tolkien's mythology but um yeah well, that was fun. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Vicky. You've pleased me. Your efforts have borne fruit, and that fruit is sweet. Here is some fruit. Mike, you get an apple. Hum, num, num, num. I fished it out of a barrel that was floating around. Okay, Vicky, <laughs> you get some fruit from the tree of Valinor. <laughs> nice. I'd like to thank I, my guest. I'd, I'd be careful biting into that because you could be biting into the sun. So, you know, you have to be, you have to be cautious with that. Oh, Come no. on, Vicky. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'd like to thank my guest, Corey Olson, the Tolkien professor. Thanks, Corey. No problem. Thanks for having me. That was fun. That was super fun. All right. Hey, TIE Fighters, listen. I know you love the show. I love it, too. But for every listener in the show, I know that there are a hundred other people who would love to listen but don't know how. Here's how you can spread the word. First, iTunes. It's still the biggest place to find new podcasts. Please give us a review if you haven't. It increases our rank and more people will see us when they go looking for science podcasts. The second is to teach people to listen to podcasts. Everybody's got a smartphone or tablet these days. It's just around the holidays. And a very low percentage of these people know how to listen to podcasts. So if you know somebody who might like the show, ask them if they know how to listen to podcasts. And if they don't know how, point them to the Stitcher app or the Podiversity app, which is a fun podcast app which carries our show third way is of course to spread the word about us online the internet's full of weird explanations of physics most of them are not very good so if you see someone on the internet talking about a topic one of our episodes covered post a comment under it telling them about the show it would be nice if people started treating podcasts like they actually had something to say instead of just four nerds around a table talking about what they ate for lunch that's it. I hope you'll help us out and point new listeners in our direction. That's it for the main part of today's show. Remember, if you like listening to scientists talk about science in their own words, you might want to listen to other shows on the Bracula Media Network, like the weekly Smith, like Science Sort of, like like Australian. Fine. Okay, so the intro song is by Ted Leo and the Pharmacists, and the end song is by John Vanderslice. Until next time, my friends, good day, and remember to keep science in your hearts. Angela And I gotta tell you, dear, before you come back here. I lost, I lost your bunny. I let him out of the cage. He 
was All right, so let's close the show, why not? Hey, um, <clears throat> Corey, can you give me two Tolkien-related uh, fruit? Tolkien-related fruit? Um, well, um, the only fruits that are described as being eaten in Tolkien are the fruits that you would normally find. Like, you can find apples and um, uh, plums and things like that um, in the Shire and elsewhere. Um, the only other things that... I, the only other fruits I would describe as being unique to Tolkien are, like, the the particular... Like, the fruits of unique trees. Like, you know, the fruits of the trees of Valinor and that kind of thing. Okay. But they're, but they're not classified. You know? Okay. So, uh... <laughs> All right, I'll give uh, Mike an apple. Mm-hmm. Hum, num, num. Hold on, I'm not doing it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't give it you yet. <laughs> what, Valinor? Valinor. Okay. Valen, yes. Okay. Uh, ben, can, can I jump in? Yeah, go ahead, Mike. You take okay. it. Okay, so in, in modern cosmology, we have this uh, concept of a uh, light horizon, which is... If I stay in my spot and I fire a photon in one direction, how far can that photon, if it doesn't interact with anything, how far does it get? Because we have this concept in physics of causality, right? You can't be sure. faster than the speed of light. And sure. so the causality means that um, the only thing I care about in my, in quote, universe is the distance that light can have traveled since T equals zero, since the Big Bang. Okay. So, so when we say infinite, you know, Ben, Ben, Ben's right. And, 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 you know, the jury's kind of out. I don't think this is a sort of metaphysical kind of question. I don't think mm-hmm. we have a good answer to it, which is you can call the universe infinite or you can call it, you know, finite. Yeah, think. yeah. But for the purposes of the discussion, what we care about is how far can light travel? Because what happens past that, we don't care. That's a causal to us. Right. Um, it certainly, uh, I mean, I agree. It would be theoretically unknowable, and uh, by you know the same uh, reasoning that you just gave. Um, right. But I guess I guess it, it leads me to the question of what then are we calling t equals zero? Right. Okay. So, um, so the deal is that. Uh, the conceit here is that is that we're playing with infinity, and it, it, it's it's kind of tricky if you're um, if you're not used to the mathematics of dealing with infinity. Right? Um, yes. you're like, how can you compare if if one thing is infinite and another th- thing is infinite? How can you say that one is bigger than the other? Right. And wh- how can something shrink to zero? Right? Yes. And, and it, it does have to do with the equations, right? So we say that um, recall that what we're talking about is. Uh, the things aren't moving apart from one another. What we're talking about is uh, kind of the the the, the sponge moving, expanding yeah. out under the feet of the of right. the thing. But right? they are still moving apart from each other in the sense that, like those ants on the sponge, are further apart that's, from each other. That's yeah, right. They, yeah, they see right. each other moving apart yeah. from each other. And, and, right. and that that's the sense in which we talk about um, about the universe expanding or right. contracting sometimes, depending on right. the model. But in this case, the ants would say, "Well." Um, you know, the sponge under our feet keeps sp- stretching us apart. The universe is getting bigger. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean that the sponge ever has any edges. All it means is that the distance between any two points keeps getting larger. And that's the sense in which we mean that the universe is expanding. But in which case, we can't use the word infinite. Oh, well, in, in, in the case of the sponge, it's difficult for me to talk about an infinitely large sponge that I've smushed up with my hands. But sure. mathematically, uh, that's essentially what we're describing. And one can ask, well, how do we know that the matter doesn't just end somewhere if you walk 14 billion dire- light years in one direction or the other? Right. And that's in, in, an entirely good question. And in fact, there are physicists <coughs> interested in, in those types of questions. Um, but for the, for the matter at hand, we, we kind of apply Occam's razor, right? Um, the well, universe is, is certainly consistent. Like, okay, so the light we mm-hmm. see coming to us from uh, the nor- in the direction of the North Pole, you look up north, uh, the light from the very, very early universe, 14 billion years old-ish, uh, mm-hmm. that light tells us the temperature uh, the energy density of the universe at that time, 14 mm-hmm. billion years ago. If we look uh, t- for the south, that light has come to us from 14 billion years the uh, the opposite direction. And mm-hmm. so what we're seeing is we're seeing 
regions of the universe that are spread with a monstrous distances between them or about the same temperature. And so it's, 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 the, the data itself is fitting a description of this remarkable uniformity. Uh, and we don't know that the, uh, that the universe beyond what we can see is like the universe that we can see. But we know that it's mathematic, it, the data we see is consistent with our mathematical models. And our mathematical models describe a universe with this uniformity. Right. <clears throat> but if we're even talking about the universe beyond which we can see, it's not infinite. It's just very big. Well, I we, mean, really big. Yeah, yeah. So, so the models say infinite. Um, but the, now, yeah. do they say infinite mathematically? Yes. Because that's the problem that I have. Because, again, mathematical infinity is really quite a large number. Well, and, and, and there can't be anything b- beyond that. Yeah. Again, this, exactly. is, this is my... That's the so, whole point. But, but, but we were just suggesting that there might be things beyond that, in which case we couldn't confidently call it infinite. Oh, we just right. have to say it's very, very big. We aren't saying that there's anything beyond that. We're saying that it's okay. turtles all the way down. We're saying no matter how far you go, it's the same stuff. What we're saying is that we can't, like, it's, we're presuming it's the same everywhere. We can only see as far as we can see, but we have no reason to expect that anything else is different because our model that predicts the infinite being the same predicts everything else so well. Why would it suddenly change at the point we can't see anymore? So, uh, but, but, but again, if we're talking about it's getting bigger... It's the then, the space is getting bigger. Right. Then it wasn't infinitely large if it can increase. Oh, it this doesn't. Is, this is the it, thing that I keep. It doesn't, that I keep, it doesn't can, expand into anything. Is the yeah, it doesn't expand into anything. Yes, no, there's nothing, the there's nothing that isn't the universe. The, the right. observation is, it's, it's a very, it's what goes back to what Ben was saying before. It's, it's the simple observation that the distance between things um, is getting bigger. Yes. And... But that doesn't necessarily – this is where the sponge analogy breaks down. That doesn't mean that you need space in which the sponge can have – that it needs to take up um, more volume. It, it just is getting bigger. There's, there's no need for it to have some space that, it, that isn't the universe. Sure. Yeah. No. And it's not that I'm thinking of uh, the, the 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 problem I'm having is that if the, if the universe is getting bigger, it it must therefore by definition be displacing something else or something like that. Um, I, again, I'm just I'm just struggling with like I can I can I can conceive of two things. I can conceive of an imaginary mathematical grid which proceeds outward to infinity in all directions, um, but that's not a thing. That's that's an imagine that, that that's a that's a mathematical construct. It's not a thing. It's not stuff. Okay, um, and then I'm imagining the stuff uh, 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 be howsoever like or unlike a sponge. In fact, uh, but anyway, nevertheless, it is stuff, um, which is which fits within this infinite grid. But in as much as the mathematical the imaginary mathematical grid may go on out to infinity and however far you go you can continue you can carry on imagining a uh, grid that goes out further past that i have a hard time imagining that the uh the possibly like or unlike a sponge universe is is uh in fact if it's getting larger then it must now be larger than it used to be. Right. In which case, it didn't used to be. Oh, infinite. I see. 